Hey guys, it's Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for molecular diagnostics. So today we are going to talk about replication, transcription, and translation. So this might be a review for some of you, but I know not everyone has had this material. So we are going to go over this today. It's always a good idea to review it also, even if you have um, had this before. So here we go. Our objectives for today's lecture are number one, briefly summarize the central dogma and revised central dogma of molecular biology. Number two, outline the DNA replication cycle and RNA synthesis cycle. Number three, outline the process of translating mRNA into a protein. Number four, when given a strand of DNA, determine the complementary DNA strand and RNA strand and define the following terms, transcription, translation, codon, anticodon, intron, exon, and spliceosome. Let's begin with the central dogma of molecular biology. The central dogma can be boiled down to the concept that DNA encodes RNA and RNA encodes proteins. It's the basic framework for how genetic information gets from DNA to protein. And it was proposed in 1955 by Francis Crick. So then sometime in the 1970s, it was discovered that retroviruses can transcribe RNA into DNA with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Now, this process is known as reverse transcription. And once this was discovered, the central dogma was revised to include reverse transcription. The image here just depicts the idea that DNA can replicate itself. It can be transcribed into RNA, and that RNA can be translated into a protein. Then the dotted line shows that reverse transcription, where RNA is transcribed into DNA, can also take place. And what I want you to know about this is basically DNA encodes RNA, RNA encodes proteins. And know that reverse transcription is a thing. So we're going to talk about that more later this semester, but I just want you to be familiar with the general concept for now. So we've already talked about DNA replication, but we're going to go over it again because it's important. So we know that DNA replication is considered semi-conservative, and that means it results in two double strands, and each of those has one parent strand and one daughter strand. And the process of DNA replication is often condensed down to three parts. You've got initiation, elongation, and termination. Now replication is initiated, and the DNA strands are unzipped by helicase. Then you've got primase, which attaches RNA primers to each strand. Next, your DNA polymerase 3 begins the elongation phase by building new complementary strands of DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. It's very important, 5' prime to 3' prime direction, always. So the leading strand will be built continuously, remember, because it's built into the replication fork. And the lagging strand is built in pieces, and these are called Okazaki fragments. And once the elongation is done, DNA polymerase comes along and it removes those RNA primers, and then ligase glues those Okazaki fragments together. And that terminates the process of replication. So there you've got your initiation, your elongation, and your termination. And again, that's just a brief overview um, of the process. Now let's talk about how information in DNA is made into proteins. So the first process is transcription. And transcription is the process by which DNA information is transcribed to a new strand of RNA, and specifically messenger RNA or mRNA. And this takes place in the nucleus. Remember your DNA stays in the nucleus, so your RNA has to be built there initially. The process of transcription, it starts with RNA polymerase. Now normally helicase is the enzyme that unzips the genes. However, in transcription, RNA polymerase is what unzips your DNA strands. 
Our RNA polymerase also synthesizes the new complementary RNA strand by reading the DNA template strand. This new RNA strand is built, guess what, in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And the result is a strand of messenger RNA. During this process, the template strand of DNA is the non-coding strand. The non-template strand is the coding strand. So what's important to get out of this is that the new strand of mRNA carries the same information as the coding strand of DNA. And this is illustrated in the box in the image here. So the strand of RNA is complementary to the template DNA, except that it contains uracil instead of thymine. However, that strand is the same as the coding strand of DNA. So the mRNA carries that exact DNA code. Once the mRNA strand is synthesized, it will contain sections that are coding sections and sections that are non-coding. And the sections of the strand that are coding sections are called exons and the sections that are non-coding are called introns. Now because we only need the coding sections in our RNA strand, spliceosomes are going to come along and splice out the introns from that mRNA strand and leave them behind in the nucleus. And the exons, the coding sections of our strand, are joined together to complete our mRNA strand. It is then capped off with a 5' prime cap and a poly A tail. The poly A tail is of interest to us in molecular testing because we can use it to our advantage. So for example, if we want to isolate mRNA using a spin column, we could attach poly T's to the column so the poly A tails would bind to them. So from this slide, I want you to know um, the difference between introns and exons. I also want you to know what spliceosomes are, what they do, and why that poly A tail is useful to us. Make sure you know that introns stay in the nucleus and exons exit the nucleus. Now on to translation. Translation is the process of synthesizing a protein from a messenger RNA template. So a couple ways to remember transcription versus translation. Transcription has a C in it, and translation does not. C comes first in the alphabet. So transcription comes first in the whole process of building proteins. But you can also think of it this way, and this is how I like to think of it. Transcription is transcribing DNA to RNA. So if you were transcribing a doctor's notes, you would be copying what the doctor is saying into the chart using the same language. DNA and RNA use the same language or building blocks. But let's say you were translating for a doctor, you would be copying what the doctor is saying but using a different language. When RNA is translated into proteins, a different sort of language is being used. We use codons and anticodons rather than bases. So that's a good way to remember transcription versus translation. Okay, back to the translation process. So this occurs in the cytoplasm. After mRNA is made during transcription in the nucleus, it sort of swims out to the cytoplasm and that's where translation takes place. So as mentioned before, translation utilizes codons and anticodons. And these are three nucleotides which short, uh, form a unit and they code for a specific amino acid. Now the genetic code, which we'll get into in a moment, includes start and stop codons, and that's what signals when to start synthesizing and when to stop synthesizing that amino acid chain. The end result of translation is a polypeptide chain or a protein. So what's the step-by-step -step process for translation? Well, it starts with that strand of mRNA that was synthesized in the nucleus, 
again swims out to the cytoplasm and there it's going to bind to ribosomes which contain our RNA. And once bound, that mRNA moves along in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction until a start codon is found. Now the start codon, and you will need to know this, is AUG, and that codes for the amino acid methionine. So once we've found the start codon on the mRNA strand, transfer RNAs start transporting anticodons to pair with complementary codons on the mRNA strand. Each tRNA carries a specific amino acid. As the tRNA molecules bind to the mRNA strand, the little ribosome factory catalyzes the formation of an amino acid chain. And it does this by forming peptide bonds between each amino acid. This process continues until the ribosome encounters a stop codon, at which point the amino acid chain is released and folds up into a protein and goes and does what proteins do. But wait, what are the stop codons, you may ask? Well, there are three different stop codons, UAG, UAA, and UGA. And the ribosome only has to find one of those to stop translation. And also, you will need to know the stop codon. So there are three, UAG, UAA, and UGA. Now, remember that genetic code I was mentioning a minute ago? Well, here it is. This chart um, is meant to be read using the mRNA codon, unless otherwise specified. In this course, you will almost always read this using the mRNA codon. And if I require something else, I will definitely let you know. So this happens to be my favorite version of the chart, and it was created by the Amoeba Sisters. And I like it because it's clean and it's fairly easy to use. However, you should know there are lots of other versions of this chart out there. Some are circular, you read them from the outside in. Some are more crowded, some have all these um, weird abbreviations. Anyway, I like this chart, so I will give you this chart on the exam. So make sure that this makes sense to you and that you know how to read it. Let's do some examples just to make sure we've got it down. So the first example here is the mRNA codon UGC. And we want to know what protein this codon will code for. So using the chart, we look at the first base U, which is the top row. And the second base is G, so the fourth column all the way to the right. Using those two bases, we have now narrowed down to the top right box in the chart. Now the third base is C. So the protein in that box that lines up with C is cysteine. So now we know the protein that the mRNA codon UGC codes for is cysteine. So the next example, we have mRNA codon AAG. So we go to the first base, we have the third row A. And then we go to the second base, we have the third column A. So we've narrowed down to the box with asparag asparagine and lysine in it. And then we look for our last base in that codon, G, which is that bottom line. And so we know that codes for lysine. So let's do a couple more examples. mRNA codon CGA. And we line those up and we know that codes for arginine. Then we have the mRNA codon UAG. And what does that code for. That actually, remember, is one of our stop codons, but you can see in the chart it also tells you that is a stop codon. So please remember to read this chart using the mRNA codon. Do not use the tRNA anticodon. That will not get you the correct amino acid. So if I were to ask you what is the tRNA anticodon if the mRNA codon is UGC? You would tell me ACG, right? So I don't want you to get those two confused. Always read this chart using the mRNA codon. Okay, to review, make sure that you can answer these questions. 
what is the central dogma of molecular biology? Can you tell me what semi-conservative means in regards to DNA replication? And if you needed to, could you briefly outline the process of DNA replication? What about transcription and translation? Can you tell me where DNA replication takes place? And where does transcription take place? And what about translation? Where does that one take place? And finally, and we just talked about this, if I give you an mRNA codon and the genetic code chart, could you determine the protein or the amino acid that it codes for? Now, if any of these are stumping you, please, please, please let me know so that I can help you. And finally, here's some memes. Um, I got some requests on my course evaluations to include more memes in my presentation, so here you are. Um, maybe they were being sarcastic, I'm not really sure, but I do like some memes. I feel like they're good memory tools sometimes. Um, and if nothing else, they're at least kind of funny and make you giggle a little bit during uh, what can sometimes be difficult courses um, and stressful times, right? But on a serious note, here is my contact information. If you need anything at all, please don't hesitate to send me an email, call me, um, and we will set up something to help you understand this material better.